Hello and welcome. I'm Jay Castle, chair of the Sarasota County Bar Association's Alternative Dispute Resolution Section. The ADR section is pleased to present today's panel discussion in partnership with the SCBA's Council for Diversity and Inclusion. Negotiation is a core competency for all mediators and lawyers. We are or should be very familiar with the basic principles of negotiation. But it's often the more subtle aspects that can make or break a successful negotiation. As our state continues to grow and diversify, and as our clients broaden their perspectives beyond the borders of the US, practitioners are finding it important to gain better awareness of the impact that cultural differences can have on negotiations. Today's expert panel will share their thoughts on some selected issues that can arise when negotiations occur between folks from different cultures. But first, quick housekeeping note. Our Zoom participants will have a chance to later in the presentation to ask questions of our panelists. Please type your questions into the chat box as, you, as they come to you so that we can collect and address your questions in the second part of the program. Okay, now let's start our program. Our moderator today is Shelley Freeland Eddy. Shelley is a former assistant state attorney and a former Sarasota City Commissioner. She now owns and manages her own law practice, the Freeland Eddy Law Group PA here in Sarasota, Florida, where she practices primarily in the areas of family law, criminal law, real estate, and estate planning. Shelley is an active member of the Sarasota County Bar Association. She's a member of the SCBA's Governance Committee and the SCBA Council for Diversity and Inclusion, one of our co-sponsors today. Shelley serves as the chair of the council's pipeline committee, which is dedicated to introducing diverse students to the practice of law and law enforcement here in Sarasota County. Shelley. Thank you, Jay, and good afternoon. And now let's introduce today's panel. Our first panelist is the Honorable David Dinkin. Judge Dinkin has served as a 12th Judicial Circuit, Circuit County Judge since 2003. He is the 2019 recipient of the Chief Justice Award for Judicial Excellence. Judge Dinkin has served several terms as a Sarasota County Court Administrative Judge for Sarasota County. Judge Dinkin has been active in the Conference of County Court Judges of Florida and was the conference president in 2019. At the same time, he was the Associate Dean and then Dean of the Florida DUI Adjudication Lab Program, as well as the Associate Dean of the Florida Judicial College. From 2015 until 2022, he was the Dean of the college. He's also been a faculty member for judicial education programs in Arizona, Arkansas, Georgia, Hawaii, Nevada, New Mexico, and South Carolina, as well as for the National Judicial College. Our next panelist is Raul Puig of Miami Beach. After working at two top South Florida law firms, Mr. Puig founded the in-house legal department at Royal Caribbean International, now one of the world's largest cruise lines. In 1992, Raul founded R.A. Puig PA. He specializes in international corporate legal service for select clients. Raul serves as general corporate counsel for multiple domestic and foreign companies. Raul has also acted as lead counsel in hundreds of domestic and foreign company purchases and sales transactions, as well as representing individual investors, acquiring or selling equity stakes in or providing private financing to such companies. Our third panelist today is Giselle Gutierrez. Giselle is a shareholder of Stearns, Weaver, Miller, Weisler, Alda Hef and Citizen in their labor and employment and litigation departments. She represents clients before administrative agencies and federal and state courts in cases involving employment discrimination, retaliation, unpaid wages, defamation, and claims under the FMLA, ADA, ADEA, Title VII, and more. Giselle also handles non-compete and employment contract litigation and counsels clients on data security issues. Giselle frequently conducts seminars and trainings for clients and professional organizations on a variety of topics. Giselle is the current president of the Cuban American Bar Association. She previously served as president of CABA's 
the Pro Bono Legal Services Board. From 2018 to 2023, Giselle served as governor on the Florida Board of the Florida Bar's Young Lawyers Division, the Board of Governors, and earned the 2022 Most Productive Board Member Award. To our panelists, we say welcome. Now, let's get into our first topic. Topic one, language differences and negotiations. It's now common to encounter parties and counsel for whom English is a second language. It is becoming more common to encounter folks who may not understand English at all. Giselle, can you give us an example of negotiations that you've recently handled where language differences were of primary concern and what did you do to address this dynamic? Absolutely, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction to all the other panelists today for being here and, and for all the attendees. I'm really looking forward to today's uh, important discussion. So as Shelly mentioned, I practice commercial litigation, but a large part of what I do uh, is employment law. And in both of those areas of law, I find that language barriers uh, come up quite often in negotiations and mediation. So for my employment law cases, I would say eight or nine out of 10 times, we're going to have either the client or the opposing party that doesn't speak English. Okay, so this is something, at least in South Florida, that I see come up it's like an everyday thing for me. You know, it happens all the time throughout the litigation process. Um, but but I think it's most important in, in the ne negotiation and, and mediation um, piece. So one example, uh, I was recently handling a mediation for a client who had terminated an employee. And of course, the employee um, ended up bringing a lawsuit under, uh, in this particular case, it was a pregnancy discrimination um, lawsuit and, and some other pieces, uh, like a whistleblower as well. But, you know, there were some sensitive issues in this case, like she had just lost her pregnancy. And so, you know, it was it was a, a tough, uh, a tough case, um, even though, there, you know, the, the client had my client had its reasons for, for termination. Um, but you have to kind of approach these with a certain level of sensitivity. And, and she did not speak English. I mean, she spoke enough, the, the, the plaintiff spoke enough English to kind of get, get along, but really her, her main language was Spanish. All the communications that she had with the company were all in Spanish. So when we got to the court ordered mediation, the first thing that we did right, right before that was making sure, and this is a practice pointer, it doesn't have to be Spanish, it can be any, any language barrier, that the mediator is going to speak the same language as the plaintiff or the party that doesn't speak English, right? And, and the reason why is you want to try to create as many people in their corner as possible. Um, and, and, and especially if it's an opposing party, you know, you're trying to get to a resolution here and you want to make that party feel comfortable. So that's the first thing I would recommend and, and that I did in this case is to get a mediator. So I, I got a mediator who spoke Spanish, who I, I refer a lot of my uh, Spanish speaking uh, plaintiffs to. Um, and and I, I do defense work for, for the most part. But if there's a plaintiff that speaks Spanish, I, you know, I try to go with this mediator. And um, and it's really helpful because it created a, a sense of confidence in the plaintiff, and, and that's necessary, I think, to come to a resolution. Uh, the second thing we did was encourage the plaintiff to have an interpreter. You know, if the plaintiff's attorney or the other side's attorney uh, speaks the same language, maybe that's not as necessary. But in this case. Um, her attorney didn't speak Spanish. And so there was a language barrier in between the plaintiff and her own attorney. And so we encouraged them to have an interpreter and, and they did. And so she had that extra person in her corner. Um, and, and third, you know, when we got to the actual negotiation, I went ahead and, and introduced myself in Spanish. I, I happen to speak Spanish. And so that might not be an option for everyone if they don't speak the same language as um, the the other side, but in this case, I did, um, and I explained actually a little bit about how the mediation was going to go from my perspective. Now, I know that's typically the mediator's job, but I want the plaintiff in this case to know from me that I'm going to follow the rules and, and tell 
her in in my in her language that I was going to follow the rules set out by the mediator, right? And so I thought it was important that she understood that. And um, I think it went a long way to kind of easing her concerns. I think this touches a little bit about hiring a diverse workforce, you know, having people uh, at your firm that can take these sort of cases and and really be an asset to a mediation or a litigation. And let's say you know you're you're a smaller firm or you're solo, you can always work with co-counsel because they're going to be invaluable to um, the entire case, but particularly a, a mediation. Thank you so much, Giselle. I see Raul and Judge Dinkin both nodding your heads in agreement as we're talking about the, the need to ensure that communication is consistent throughout. Um, Raul, do you have any um, pointers to add? Well, um, one thing that came to mind uh, is I was representing a client of German descent here in Miami who was attempting to extricate themselves from a, a uh, an operating agreement with somebody who lived in Mexico. And the woman who lived in Mexico naturally um, had Mexican counsel, and uh, they had attempted to translate the operating agreement or or the agreement we were working on to Spanish. And when I reviewed the translation, and I'm not a, a fantastic Spanish speaker, especially when it comes to to legal terms, but I found that that just by virtue of the fact that that uh, interpretation of Mexican law is a completely different thing from uh, what we do here in the United States. Some of the terms in the agreement did not really line up with the intent of the parties um, here in the U.S. And so I found that interesting. We had to call in a translator to to really take a look at all of the language and and make sure that there was a meeting of the minds between the two people. Um, so that's an example of of what I believe Giselle was talking about. And that speaks to the next part of advocacy. She talked about the, the spoken communication and you're talking about the verbal communication and the importance of translating documents as well as the oral and verbal translation and having competent translators for the spoken language of the parties. Would that be right? Correct. Okay, wonderful. Um, um, sometimes the court provides interpreters for court proceedings and judging and I want to direct this to you um, as it relates to um, petitions where an individual might be um, indigent and unable to afford counsel. It seems to me that in the court perspective, a person doesn't have the same access to interpreter as they do to counsel. Do you have any opinions as to how this might impact court proceedings? Sure. Since we're talking about civil cases, I'll, I'll address that particular issue first. Let me say thank you for letting me hang out with all you people. Um, I recognize a lot of the names here of attorneys that I used to practice with uh, back when my hair was all a different color. And so it's very, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, the interpreters uh, that the court has access to uh, is limited. Uh, we are constantly looking for uh, more and more certified interpreters. We're, we're limited in court as to the type of interpreters we could use. We're first supposed to uh, ask for certified interpreters and they have to go through a specialized training to become certified interpreters. Long as the day where we used to, in the old days, we used to have court and we'd look out in the audience and say, can anybody interpret for this person? And to show you an example of how bad it was, I had one young lady raise her hand and says, well, I can help out. I can interpret. And the defendant was charged with a crime. So I said, all right, I need you to interpret exactly what the defendant says and what I say in response. She said, fine, I can do that. I said, great. I said, uh, I want you to say the following. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, you're here today charged with uh, a lewd and lascivious conduct. Her first response was, Oh my God, that's disgusting. And I said, no, if you want to interpret, you can't, you can't comment on it. You just need to interpret. And so she said, okay, can we do it again? I said, fine. So I repeat it. And she said, she looked over at him and I, honest to God, she said in a very loud voice, 
you're charged with lewd and lascivious because her idea was interpreting was just speaking louder. So we're much more sensitive, thank goodness, but we still need more interpreters. And in civil cases, we are, we are scrambling to get people in court that are willing to spend the time and we don't have the funds for it. We just don't have the funds uh, in our coffers to provide for interpreters in civil cases. So we ask the parties to bring their own interpreters. Wow. Um, thankfully, things have improved from those days. And, and I remember being in court with you, Your Honor, when you would make those questions known. And I think I've heard you interpret a few cases in my days. So <laughs> a long time ago. Um, we're going to go to our next topic now, and it is differing attitudes toward the role of the legal system. We as lawyers have strong attitudes about the rule of law, the role of courts and litigation and other aspects of our legal system. But lawyers and parties coming from other parts of the world or even other parts of the country or even other parts of the state may not share those same attitudes. Those differences might shape the form and content of negotiations. Raul, this is for you. Can you give us some examples of the dynamic from your profession as it relates to these um, issues? Certainly, and, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be a part of this uh, esteemed panel and this seminar. Um, yeah, I've got a few examples. Um, one is uh, when I was a Royal Caribbean, we would have occasion to have ship, uh, ships, vessels built or refitted. And uh, when we would have a vessel uh, built in Norway or France, for instance, the shipbuilding or ship repair contract would run to maybe eight to 10 pages. It was a very, very simple document. Whereas we had one vessel refitted in California and the contract was in excess of 100 pages. And the difference was that in at least my experience was that in Europe, they they don't put everything in the contract because they expect the parties to discuss um, any differences throughout the process. Um, whereas in the US, by virtue of our fairly litigious society, a really good corporate lawyer will try to come up with every potential scenario that could be litigated and put that in the contract. And that's why they run to many, many, many pages. I mean, personally, my my asset purchase agreements are 48 pages long, not including the exhibits. Um, so there's a real cultural difference between the way parties approach a contractual relationship, depending upon what country you're dealing with. Um, that's one example. Okay. Secondly, um, I, I, again at Royal Caribbean, I had occasion to deregister one of the two vessels that were registered in Panama. Uh, and this is when the US was having all of these problems with Noriega. And I, of course, had hired local counsel to do the deregistration. And I was sweating bullets that something was going to occur to mess that process up. He was taking a very laissez-faire attitude towards it. I continued to put pressure on him. And he did send me the deregistration documents literally about three hours before the United States invaded Panama, um, which okay. would have created, obviously, a lot of problems for the parties. Um, and so that, I think, speaks to uh, what you're seeing in your own culture as opposed to what I was seeing from the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and luckily, we, you know, we managed to get it done. But he, he was basically saying the entire time, oh, this Noriega thing, this invasion thing, that's just politics for local consumption. And it may have been for him in terms of the media that he was watching and so forth. It was a completely different scenario for Royal Caribbean. And luckily, we got that done in time. Uh, as a third example, um, I recently represented some Brazilian clients that, that essentially purchased a building, purchased all of the condominiums in a fairly small 10 unit building here in Miami Beach with the intent of uh, basically uh, advertising and renting the units out through Airbnb. What they did not realize is that the city of Miami Beach has a ton of regulations when it comes to that sort of business, because it's essentially mm -hmm. running a hotel. Um, and they had racked up 
literally tens of thousands of dollars in fines because they had not complied with the city of Miami Beach regulations by the time they hired me. Um, so I had to spend a tremendous amount of time in the city just working through all of the paperwork and, and seeing that they complied. And as Brazilians, they had a very, very hard time understanding how uh, a city could have so much power over a private business, uh, uh, over this business that they were trying to launch here in the US and had no understanding of sort of the labyrinth that you have to go to from a regulatory or a civic perspective just to be able to operate a business. Um, so a good deal of my time was spent educating them on that. Um, and, and you know, luckily everything was resolved, but it did sour them a little bit to, to doing business here, here in the city of Miami Beach. Sure. Um, and so what it sounds like that I'm hearing you say is that, you know, and, and our practices, we are competent in our practice areas, but it sounds like that there is a degree of cultural competence that should be um, aspired to by us as members of the bar as we're dealing with clients that may have different cultural backgrounds or may have different first languages, or this may be living in parts of the world where there are issues that may form the way they see the, the, the legal system. Would that be fair? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And really the key word is empathy, okay? You, uh, as an attorney, you have to be empathetic to your client's culture, the culture of counsel from another country and so on and so forth. You have to understand their viewpoint, particularly as a transactional attorney, two sides are trying to build something. They're trying to build a partnership. And so throughout the negotiation, you have to have that sort of empathy. You have to understand where they're coming from. And if you're representing a client on our side, you have to educate your client on where the other side is coming from. Uh, from a cultural perspective. And in terms of negotiations with other attorneys where there are diverse clients, how does this become an asset in the way that you either move the case along, get it settled, reach an agreement, et cetera? Well, the more you understand the other side, the more likely you are to reach a, a, a binding agreement, a, a meeting of the minds between the parties. You know, So mm -hmm. um, a, another quick example, I was representing a client who was selling a restaurant here on Miami Beach in an asset sale to an Italian uh, company. Um, I totally understood where the Italians were coming from. Um, I explained that to my client who was a US resident. However, as part of that deal, we had to assign the lease uh, for the premises where the restaurant was located. The landlord kept demanding more and more guarantees from the Italian principals. And at one point, she simply insulted their honor. I, I don't know of any other way to put it. But because she kept demanding these sort of guarantees from them, in their eyes, they thought, this woman thinks we're liars and thieves. And the deal blew up because of that. It literally, we were, mm -hmm. we were an inch away from closing. And she insult in their eyes insulted them to such a degree that they simply backed out of the deal and and did not move forward with the asset purchase agreement wow giselle and your client contact and in your practice have you experienced any of these issues uh absolutely and i i think that you know raul touched it perfectly it really is uh, about empathy i mean you have to think of not everyone has the same justice system that we do. I mean, they just have completely different justice systems. And so the idea of what someone else who um, is in this country, even, you know, maybe a, a naturalized citizen, but and lives here now, and this is their country, they still have this idea of what fair means to them, right? fair means X, Y, Z, but here, you know, fair means something else and fairness is achieved by these steps that they're, they may not be used to. And so I think kind of doing a little bit of your own research when you have someone uh, on the opposing side and you're trying to get to, um, you know, a settlement of what, what does fair mean to them? You know, what, what is their background and, and taking that extra step? I mean, Role in, in the negotiation that you had with, uh, you know, the Europeans, I, I mean, I don't know where along the process you learned that 
they don't make a hundred page agreements. You know, I'm sure it would have been much more beneficial if you would have learned that at the beginning of mm -hmm. the case, right? Versus after there's been all this kind of miscommunication. Um, so taking time to to do that research in the beginning when you have someone who's who's uh, English is not their first language or they're 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 from another country to really understand what, what fairness means to them. If I might add one thing too, you're absolutely right. And and there, the importance of co-counsel really comes into play. If I was doing business in Norway, I hired a Norwegian law firm to help me with that business. And so they're the ones who educate you on the cultural norms in their country. Um, you still have to do the majority of the work, but you're doing it with that in mind. And And they're there to backstop you if you're going to do something that's going to screw up the deal. So that's that's absolutely correct. And how do you take that advocacy um, into um, the court? How do you make the court more aware of the issues that might be present in, in, in your your particular litigation? Well, I'm not a litigator, so that, that's a question for gotcha. just uh, uh, I'm purely uh, corporate. It, Gotcha. And I, I think what I'm hearing you saying is we can, wherever we are in the this legal process, we can all benefit from these tools and resources. And as practicing attorneys, we have an obligation um, as a part of our advocacy to ensure that we understand our client, understand the parties, understand the issues, but also understand um, the, the cultural um, intricacies of the, the practice area and the case that we're involved in, and that it would be a disservice to our clients into their cases if we didn't do that. Absolutely. And, and I think um, for Raul, it's gonna be part of the negotiation process. And for me, it, it may be part of the settlement mediation process, but it may be throughout the entire litigation that this comes up, you know? So it is, it is really not, um, it, it's not a bubble, right? It's not a one part of a case or a, a deal that's important. It's, it's, it stretches it across the entire thing. Thank you. Um, our next topic is implicit bias in negotiations, and it's our, our last topic. Um, we've talked about um, other areas, and we want to recognize that some of us may have preferences or possibly preconceived notions about certain ideals and certain groups of people without even realizing it. Some of us may be familiar with this concept, but we want to take a few moments to assure common understanding. Judge Dinkin, please define implicit bias. What is it um, and how might a practitioner recognize it as it's happening? Well, that's a simple thing to do. All right, before I do that, let me jump back for a second because I, I heard some good points about uh, uh, the um, concept of fairness in mediation. Uh, we teach judges, and I think it applies to mediators as well, is that it is not only important and paramount to be fair in your dealings with all parties in reality, but there needs also to be that perception of fairness. Because no matter how fair you actually are, if you're not perceived as being fair, you're not doing your job, whether you're a mediator or you are a judge. And to be able to do that, Raul pointed out that you need to know a little bit about the people you're speaking to. And for example, uh, we teach judges that sometimes when uh, people that appear before you or them are not looking at them, it's not a sign of disrespect. It's a sign in their culture not to look directly at a person of such reverence as a judge or as a mediator. Uh, understand body language. Don't misinterpret body language. If you're not sure, ask. Uh, and I'd like to throw a question out to everybody, whether it be in the chat room today or the lady, later date. I would like to know how judges can make it easier and more productive for both attorneys and mediators when we send cases to mediation, what we, what we could do in advance. Because all civil cases, whether you want to or not, all civil cases are mandated to at least attempt mediation once. So we will be sending all those cases out to mediation, but there might be a way for us as judges to better prepare the parties 
to participate effectively in mediation. So any suggestions you all have with regard to that, I'd appreciate. You can send it directly to me, you can send it to our chief judge, uh, you can put it in the chat room today. Uh, implicit bias. Back in, I think it was 2017 or 2018, uh, former Justice Lawson uh, let me carry his books and get him coffee and work with him in, in talking to the county bar, Sarasota County Bar, about implicit bias. And we had, we had taught this once before down at the uh, National Consortium in Miami. And what we decided back then is we weren't going to use the words implicit bias because that second word, bias, that's all anybody heard. And the response was defensive. I'm not biased. And, and that's not what we we're trying to discuss or convey or, or work out. So we, we, we named the course what we don't think when we think. Mm. And mm. implicit bias was coined back in 1995 by two doctors, Dr. Menaji and Dr. Greenwald. And uh, they termed it as an unconsciously held set of beliefs or set of associations about a particular social group. That was how it was originally designed, uh, defined. And then in about 1998, Greenwald and Banaji um, established or published an implicit association test. And if you ever wanna check and see if you have any implicit biases, and I'm changing the term now because what I refer to it as, as unconscious preferences, mm -hmm. that's what they are. They're unconscious preferences. It's not a bias, it's really a preference. Uh, they established the, uh, I think they called it the, um, they wrote a book called Blind Spot, which I highly recommend. And they also did the uh, Harvard Implicit Association Test. And if you go on the Harvard website, you can find a, you can sign on for a test about anything from physical appearance to social group, to ethnicity, to, um, sex, sexual preference, just about anything. And you take the test and they will score it for you right then and you'll get the results and to see how, how you feel or how you uh, prefer. The origin, origins that we found out from um, unconscious preferences come from families, uh, school, peer group, uh, life experiences in general, books we read, television shows. Real important, we found, that the different television shows people grew up uh, watching help form these, these unconscious preferences. And, and an example of unconscious preference is, is what your eye does, for example. When you look out of the corner of your eye, your eye will fill in what it can't, what it, it's not looking at with background around it which is what studies show. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll take what you can see and fill in the blanks until you actually look directly at it. That's what your mind does when you make quick decisions. Your, your unconscious mind, there's like, I think the study showed there was maybe 200 billion connections in the, in the human brain. Out of those 2 billion connections, the brain, the brain processes about 4.7 billion points of data every second. So to allow that to happen, your brain is quickly filling in the blanks. So what we teach judges is which I think equally apply to attorneys and mediators is that the best way to avoid an unconscious preference and make sure you're making the decision or making the assumption correctly is just take a second. Just don't be so quick to respond. Step back, take a couple seconds, think about it. Am I making this decision based upon what's before me? Or am I just quickly responding for, for an unconscious reason? Hope that answers. Thank you, Judge. 
Yes, definitely. I'm just taking notes as you were talking. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to ask you about um, in terms of what judges are learning in school, um, there's been recent articles in the Florida Bar News and across the state with regard to changes in um, training that is facilitated for judges. Um, and it relates to an administrative order of the Florida Supreme Court uh, for 2023 that recently dissolved the Standing Committee on Fairness and Diversity and remove the requirement of mandatory diversity training. Um, it states in part that these principles will be pursued in part by ensuring that the mandatory Florida Judicial College courses for new judges continues to emphasize the code of judicial conduct, which imposes obligations centered on judicial professionalism, procedural fairness, and non-discrimination in the court system. In your opinion, is that consistent or the same as what you've just taught us? Judges have no Or can opinion. you answer that? <laughs> judges don't have opinions. And I certainly am not in a position to um, give my opinion on a decision made by the Florida Supreme Court. I can explain it as to what they said and why they said they said it. Uh, there was a standing committee on diversity that was established uh, back in 2004. The purpose of that committee was uh, it was created by Supreme Court administrative order. And the purpose of that committee was to basically deal with education for judges as it relates to diversity and fairness. And that was the primary goal of that committee. Um, what the Supreme Court said is that they amended the Florida rule of general practice and judicial administration. There is a rule, it used to be called the rules of judicial administration. It's now called the Florida general practice and judicial administration. There's a rule 2.320, which deals specifically with continuing judicial education. What they did is they decided that there was no more any need for a one day course. There used to be a requirement that within the first three years, every new judge had to take a full day course on fairness and diversity. They did away with that. There's no longer a requirement. They, in their opinion, they stated that they were concerned that it was overbroad because course content about fairness and diversity uh, may or may not pertain to judicial ethics. That's in their opinion, word for word. They also went on to say that they were confident that the Florida Judicial College, which is a college that all new judges must attain, must attend, excuse me, it's a two week course. There's a week in January and there's a week in March and it's split up so you don't lose a judge for two weeks at a time uh, in, in, in continuum. So they left it up to the Florida Judicial College to provide the initial training for judicial ethics standards, and then to follow it up with the county conference for county judges, the circuit conference for circuit judges, the appellate conference for appellate judges, and then there's another conference, a college called the Advanced Judicial Studies College, which is uh, the current dean of that is actually one of our judges, Judge uh, Donna Padar. And that's what they did. Do any of those courses include education on cultural differences like those that we've discussed today that might impact negotiations or access to the legal system? Yes. Uh, and Shelly, I'd like to um, just add something here. So this is relating to um, case number 23114. Um, it was a sua sponte decision from uh, the Florida Supreme Court. And uh, the end of the decision uh, prior to the dissent from Justice LaBarga actually requested a uh, comment from uh, the public attorneys um, and the Cuban American Bar Association submitted a comment in, in response to um, the, the order. And basically what we respectfully requested was that this be reversed because um, 
you know, to, to take out the definition, to take out the requirement of fairness. I mean, just kind of isolating those two words, um, it seems that that's at the core of, of you know, what our judiciary should, should be learning. And um, another piece of our comment was that, you know, whether or not you are encouraging diversity is one thing, but the fact that we live in a diverse state is, is, is that it, it is a fact. And so it is incumbent upon us to teach our judiciary how to address our diverse population that already exists um, in a way that they perceive as fair, kind of going back to that comment by uh, Judge Denkin. So if anyone is interested in seeing the comment, I'm happy to, to share it. Thank you, Giselle. Um, at this time, thank you, Judge Dinkin, for um, providing that update to us and walking us through, you know, um, the, the way that judges see this issue. And I encourage everyone to respond to Judge Dinkin's question, which he asked to us as the bar, as to what we could do, you know, what they could do as judges, you know, to um, in advance um, with regard to the referral to mediation. I thought I saw some comments pop up, but thank you for your attention to that issue. At this time, I think we're gonna go into some questions from our um, virtual audience. And I'm going to turn it over to Tamara, I believe. Good afternoon. We did have one question. Um, and this is for all of our panelists. What are some things that we as attorneys and mediators uh, can do to break implicit and or unconscious bias? Anyone wanna chime in? I mean, I, I can start. I think um, Judge Denkin hit the nail on the head. It's, it is awareness. That is the first step of being able to uh, address um, implicit bias, unconscious bias, um, because if you are unaware, there's no way you can go from there. So the the first the first step, I think, is being aware that we all have those, and they will all be different. Um, there's many resources that kind of teach you about what your implicit biases could be. So uh, motivation to address that is, is really the second piece. Well. Well, I think I think that's absolutely right. You have to be able to see it in order to be able to deal with it. Um, I, I recently represented um, a Jamaican company that was acquiring uh, basically digital digital companies here in the United States, and in my you know in these big Zoom meetings or conference calls with the with the seller, I could tell that, and maybe it's because I'm Cuban and I came to this, you know, to the United States very young and, and saw quite a bit of prejudice and so on and so forth. I could tell that the other side was not really taking my Jamaican clients' requests seriously. It, it, it's almost as if they had a kind of superiority complex um, with regard to this transaction. And, and I warned my clients that this was going on. And upon further due diligence, I found that what this company said they were selling, they really weren't selling. There were, there were all kinds of problems with their assets. There were all kinds of problems with the liens. And I almost felt like that company was, was essentially trying to dupe my clients because they thought my clients weren't sophisticated enough. Now, these guys, my Jamaican clients, are some of the most brilliant clients I've, I've dealt with in my career. So they grossly underestimated what was going on. And we pulled the plug on that deal. But I could I could feel the bias. I could see it, you know, uh, in dealing with the other side. And so could my clients. Um, and you know what? They were willing to put up with it to a certain degree as long as they got a good deal. Uh, they didn't care. They were playing chess. These, guys, these other guys were playing checkers. But you know, we just found so many things that were wrong with the assets that we we thankfully pulled the plug on the deal. And luckily, you know, a few months later, they found a another company that they that they acquired. So small example. Thank you, Raul. Judge Zink. You know, uh, 
there's a test online. It's called the Stroop test, S-T-R-O-O-P. And it's a test. I don't want to go into any detail about it, but the, the outcome of the test, it helps you understand the fact that while our automatic responses, our automatic brains are powerful, they can be overridden. And I would suggest that the test involves two to three rounds and it takes maybe 15 minutes to do the actual test. Uh, it helps us understand that while we may have unconscious preferences, we, we certainly have the ability to make ourselves aware of them and then make sure they don't unduly influence our decision-making process. So if you get a chance, take a look at that as well. Thank you, Judge Nikon. Tamara, do we have any other questions from the chat? We have one other question that came in. Um, and this question is directed to Judge Dinkin. Oh, no. In your, <laughs> in your research of implicit bias, do you believe that there is a connection between unconscious bias and microaggression? Wow, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, I have not looked into that. That's, a, that's an interesting concept that I will look into. Raul or Giselle, any thoughts? Mm, I don't think I know enough about microaggression to comment on it, but it seems to me that that a bias of of any sort would result in some sort of aggression, whether it's both macro or micro. Um, but I'm I'm speculating. Yeah, I, I imagine that one would have to influence, I mean, that would have to influence uh, microaggressions because um, I will tell you that I, I, I think, and this is why I, I think lawsuits are brought in the first place. And for the most part, people, at least for an employment law, I mean, people feel like they've been slighted. Like you're not going to really bring a lawsuit against your employer unless you feel like they, they were unfair. Um, and a lot of the times that's unconscious. So certain things that are done are not done on purpose, you know, and not, it's not coming from just the, the defense lawyer here, but um, I, I would imagine that if you have some implicit bias that, that you would also be uh, unconsciously kind of putting those slights or put downs without even realizing it. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other questions in the chat, we'll turn it back over to Jay. Just one other question came in. Um, Great. Any suggestions on handling cultural differences between opposing counsel? Oftentimes adversarial relationships, which is different than client relationship. Hmm. That's very important. Wow, we didn't talk about that. Giselle? Uh, you know, for me, this this kind of just goes back to our our role as professionals. Um, you know, we we have certain rules that we need to abide by, and I think that when it comes to professional courtesies, I mean, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. You should be giving those. So, I, I really don't see this come up in my practice at all. To be honest with you, I think that. I, we have a good bar down here and, and I don't I don't see this come up as an issue. I can address that. Um, there was a time when I was, I guess I was only about six or seven years out of law school and I misspoke before. I actually started out as a litigator my, uh, my first year out of school and then moved over to corporate law. Um, and uh, there was an occasion where I was representing my father pro bono. He paid for my law school career so <laughs> there um and uh he was a defendant in a lawsuit and the plaintiff's attorney was 
for lack of a better term, a, a real good old boy. And he was pers purposefully mispronouncing my father's name throughout the deposition. But it started at the beginning, I let it slide a few more times, I corrected him another time. And then I, I called the deposition off, I stopped the deposition. Um, because I was trying to work with him, but this was a guy who simply could not respect, you know, opposing counsel or their client. Um, and I spoke about, we spoke about micro, this was a macroaggression. This wasn't a microaggression. He was doing it on purpose. Um, and I pulled the plug uh, on the depot. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, you're going to run up against people like that. And you have to stand up for your client and for yourself when that happens. Thank you, Raul, for sharing. Okay. Okay. All right, Jay. I'd be interested before we turn it over to Jay if any if any of the participants today attendees um, have kind of experienced that as well with, um, with with opposing counsel because I mean I think the the question is coming up uh, for a reason. Maybe not. We have seen it in court a lot, and when we see it in court. Um, Usually it's, they can't agree on discovery. That's the biggest thing. And, and it, it, most of the time, it's really not a legal issue. It's, it's, it's something else. Mm -hmm. So what we have done, we being some judges, is I've instructed them and along with a couple others, I want you to go out have a cup of coffee and talk about anything other than this case. Now, with, if it calls the cultural differences, Talk a little bit about your, each other's background for five minutes, then come back into court, and then we'll talk. Many times, the issues that were so dominant in the uh, party's mind up to that point are no longer issues. So they, they just need to understand that you're defined more than just the person you represent or the case that you currently have. And they have personal issues just like you do, but they have cultural differences that you need to at least to be aware of, if not understand. So it just takes, you just need to give them the opportunity to take the time to, to do that. Thank you, Judge. J judges are educated on on little tricks or ideas or suggestions on and how to uh, promote that opportunity for the attorneys. And, you know, a nice segue, Judge, thank you. I've, I've, I've got one last question. Um, you know, we've talked a lot today about the soft skills that are equally, if not important, than legal knowledge for lawyers who are trying to improve their negotiation skills. Florida Rule of Professional Conduct, Rule 4-2.1 provides, in representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. In rendering advice, a lawyer may refer not only to law, but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's situation. And a couple of our panelists earlier were talking and used the word empathy. So, so my question really is what role, if any, does empathy play in fulfilling our professional responsibilities under that rule? And does the practitioner's personal experiences with unconscious preferences play any role in their performance or their, their meeting that professional responsibility? Well, you know, I, I, I go back to what I said originally, which is I, I think empathy is paramount um, in both understanding your client and understanding opposing counsel and understanding opposing counsel's client. Um, you know, in, in the negotiation context, you constantly 
in my world where you're trying to reach an agreement um uh your 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 goal is to put these two parties together in that relationship and so the more empathetic you can be towards the other side not just culturally but what they want out of the deal um how they're seeing the deal what their motivations are to enter into the deal um that it just raises your chances of success in getting the deal done yeah i i agree with you raul and um you know one of one of the things i've learned along the way is that there are a lot of tools um in negotiation and mediation um where you identify things that are important to uh, the other side, you know, your your opponent and the opposing counsel or the client, and maybe giving those things up for your client is kind of no big deal, right? And so it's a value add for them. It's very little cost to your client. And I think you get there through empathy and through really understanding the more the more you know the more you understand the more you can see things in their shoes you're going to be in a better position to identify what are those things that are going to cost you very little and be a huge value add that's going to get that's going to get a, a settlement done or a deal done a lot sooner and both both sides happier i think agreed Just jumping in here for a quick second. Uh, one of the things that I found uh, as a mediator that gets everybody ready to actually come to an agreement is what I call the little things. Um, making sure that you don't address people by their first name, because in some cultures that's insulting. Always ask. Um, make sure that if you've got a younger person, uh, that that younger person doesn't automatically use the older person's first name. Kind of even up the room, ask questions, uh, listen to what what their cultural bias is. Because when you're mediating uh, in certain types of cases, um, both parties come at it from a different perspective. And they have to understand that the mediator isn't taking sides and respects both cultures. And it's really the little stuff. Uh, when you're talking, you know, when you're talking the first time, uh, in certain cultures, I always ask, do you mind if I use your first name? Or would you prefer that I call you Mr. or Mrs.? Uh, and the different types of negotiation techniques. Uh, in some cultures, they consider negotiation an art form. Uh, <laughs> so, if you keep it in mind, you won't get in trouble and you'll get your agreements because everybody feels that you're being fair and you're being neutral and you respect them and the cultures they're from. Great, great point, Leslie. And, and on that one, I think we're going to close. Um, we're right at our time. Uh, we hope you found today's panel discussion interesting and informative. The Sarasota County Bar Association's Council for Diversity and Inclusion and the SCBA's Alternative Dispute Resolution section would like to thank our panelists and our moderator, Shelley, for their thoughts and perspectives. This course has been approved by the Florida Bar for one CLE hour. Our course number is 2303195N. Write that down, 2303195N. Now, if you're registered, you'll also receive a certificate of attendance in the email that has that information, but just in case you don't have that, that's your number for the bar. The course is also eligible for one continuing mediator education hour, including that coveted hour of cultural diversity. Uh, education mediators are required to self-report those hours at the time of their renewal. In the coming days, we'll make this video CLE available for viewing on the Sarasota County Bar Association YouTube channel. So please don't forget to like it and share it with your friends and colleagues on your preferred social media channels. And with that, I will say good afternoon and thank you for joining us today.